isn't it? I feel like every time I listen to it, I can identify myself somewhere in that story, and it's a reminder that I need, but it's also one that kind of hurts, and that kind of echoes. Yeah. This happens every week. Can you hear me now? Okay. This pursuit of the American dream is something that it's hard not to get caught up in because our whole world and everything around us encourages it. You can see it in our children too. But the problem with the American dream is if you look at it, it doesn't really line up with the teachings of Jesus. And so before we dive in and kind of take a look at that as we continue in our series, The Apprentice, let's pray and ask God to, to come into our time today. Lord, we are so grateful to be in your presence this morning. We're so grateful for our amazing worship team and being able to come and worship so freely here in this place, Lord. And as we dive into your word, God, I pray that you would show us what you want us to see. Help us to know, Lord, if there are areas in our life that we need to change so we can become more like you. And as we grow and as we um, just continue on this journey, we'll give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> We are in our series, The Apprentice, and we are learning to become more like Jesus. We spent the beginning of our sermon series talking about an apprenticeship to a rabbi and how our apprenticeship is to Jesus, our rabbi. And as we are taking a look today at the simple life, uh, we can look at our teacher, we can look at the life of Jesus, and we can see that he lived a pretty simple life. He didn't worry about where he would lay his head at night. He didn't worry about what he would eat. He traveled, he enjoyed meals with friends, and he focused on the mission that God had given him. Now, if you take a look at my life, and maybe even your life, maybe simple isn't the word that you would use to describe it. I know, like, I would probably use words like crazy or chaotic or overwhelmed when describing my life. But I think that as we grow and as we learn to... Um, follow the footsteps of Jesus before we can learn how to live simply ourselves, we have to identify what it is that's complicating our world. And I would like to suggest that the pursuit of the American dream is one of those things that becomes an obstacle or a stumbling block in our walk as we chase after God. But here at Reclaim, John and I never want you to take our word for it. Our opinions are not profound. We don't have any, any special insight ourselves. But what we have is we have a Bible. This is our guide. The, the Word of God says that the Bible is a lamp into our feet, right? We all want direction. We all want to know what to do, how to navigate this life. Should I take this job? Should I move? Should I stay? Where, what should I do with my kids? And there's, Every step we take, God has the guide, the answer. Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. So, don't listen to what we have to say, but let's dive into the Word of God today and see what God has to say. Amen? So we are going to spend the majority of our time in Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 19, probably a story you don't land on and linger on too long, The Rich Young Ruler. So we're going to begin reading in verse 16. It says, Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which one, he inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these things I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered. This is the part none of us like. <laughs> if you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Before we spend too much time tearing that apart, we should look at the main character in our story and figure out what we know about him. Uh, the name of the story is The Rich Young Ruler, so we know he's rich, he's young, he's a ruler, right? It doesn't take a theology degree to figure out that much. If you look at that word young in the original text, it probably would have encompassed about 20 to 40 years old. So if you're here today and you're under 40, you know, you can just celebrate knowing you're young. Um, if you're over 40, we can go Old Testament where they live to be like 500 years. And as long as you're still alive, right? <laughs> we also learn that he's a ruler. This would have been a Jewish leader in the synagogue. So this kid is young. He has his whole life ahead of him. He has money and he has power and authority. 
But here he is, coming before Jesus, and he's saying, I still lack something. I have all this stuff, and that's still not it. I'm missing something. I love a quote that I read by the great theologian Jim Carrey um, that said, I wish everybody could become rich and famous and get everything they've ever dreamed of so that then they could see that that's not the answer. And it is so true, because I think in the back of our head, we're guilty of that sort of thinking. If I could just get the promotion, if I could just have a bigger house, a nicer car, if I could find that special someone to share my life with, we feel like if we could just attain these things on earth, then we would be happy. And it's sad to me to look at our, our children, the next generation, because they are buying into that even more than we are. They feel like if they could just be rich and famous, then they will have arrived. That's why they're out there peddling slime, trying to be the next YouTube stars, right? That's, that's their goal, and it's sad to see. But, but this man is desperate, so he approaches Jesus, and he says, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Uh, addressing him as teacher would have been respectful. That would have been like approaching him, calling him rabbi, teacher. He approached him respectfully, humbly, sincerely. He wanted an answer. What do I need to do? He wanted the three-step process, right? The five steps to happiness. He wants the formula. Some of you are like that too. You're like, just give me the three steps so I can go to lunch, right? I just want to know what I need to do to have eternal life. Eternal life is used over 50 times. That phrase is used over 50 times in the Bible. And it's oftentimes used to talk about um, the afterlife, eternity, salvation. And it does mean all of those things. But it, I, if you actually do a word study, it means so much more than that. It actually speaks to quality of life as well. It speaks to being alive to God and the things of God, even while here on this earth. So he's going to God going, okay, I have money and I have power and I have influence, but I'm still empty. I want life and I want life to the full. So he says, what do I do? So Jesus says, okay, well, if you want, if you want to do that, then you're going to have to follow my commandments. Well, as a, a leader in the synagogue and as a good young Jewish boy, he would have known the commandments like the back of his hand. He would have had them memorized. And so, you know, as Jesus goes, he's like, which ones? You know, like, I know them all. Which ones do you want me to follow? And as Jesus reads them, don't lie and don't steal. And he reads the list. The guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've done all that. I've kept all of those. Now, we know there's no way he could have kept them all because nobody's perfect. You're telling me he never stole I mean, the Bible tells us if we even look at a woman with lust, we've committed adultery in our heart. So, I mean, the guy didn't keep the commandments, but he was unable to see his own sinful nature. He was unable to see the areas that he was falling short. Now, I think we would have had a tendency to call him out on it and go, well, let me tell you, you just lied last week. Let me show you where you've missed the mark. But that's not what Jesus does. He just keeps peeling back the layers. He said, all right. If you want to follow me, then how about this? How about you go and sell your possessions and give it to the poor, and then come follow me? He didn't really like that response. Jesus had found the issue. Jesus knew that the issue was the heart, not his ability to check the boxes. Came to church. Served. He wasn't after that. He wasn't after the actions. He was after his heart and he found the stumbling block. And I think so many of us have a stumbling block in that area too. And I don't think that, that we intentionally do it. I think that we just got, get caught up in this pursuit. And we don't recognize that essentially when we say yes to all the things of this world, we're saying no to Jesus in a lot of ways. I mean, we're not trying to. That's not our heart. That's not what we want to do but we're so caught up in it, we don't even recognize it. We're gonna be taking a mission trip to Haiti in October. If God called you, could you go? Were you able to come serve last week? I think that we, we have so many hours that we're working in kids and sports and things we do, and because we've said yes to all these things, we're not in a position to say yes to God, not because we don't want to, but because we've set our life up that way. And we've set our life up that way because the world tells us to. 
You know, John and I were really faced with this a few years back. We were, we were in a position where things were changing. Some of you know our story. But things were changing and we weren't sure what God wanted us to do. And we looked around at our life and we thought, well, if God called us to do a number of things, we couldn't do it. We would have to say no. Because we have this mortgage and we have these cards and we have this house and we have these schedules. And we, we couldn't say yes to God. And so God began to call us to like really evaluate our lives and strip back and go, let's downsize. Let's really simplify our lives. And so the process began. And we're total lake people, so we spent a lot of time at Lake Pleasant. So we were out there on our boat one day, and I jokingly said to John, well, wouldn't it be fun if we sold everything and moved on to a houseboat? And then it's like jokes on me because that's what God did. We sold everything. Now, some of you were there. I had a giant yard sale in my house where, because if you live on a houseboat, you don't need plants and pictures on the wall and you don't need tons of shoes because you don't really have a closet. And so I literally had people like walking out with my stuff. My friends that helped me, they kept coming over to me. They're like, are you okay? Like, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm fine. God had prepared my heart for it. And so John came back, actually. He wasn't there. He left me there to do it by myself. But he came back and he's like, where is the giant pot on our front porch? And I'm like, I sold it. And he's like, it's stuccoed to the house. Like, they had to rip it off of our pillar. But like, I mean, we're, I, I was all in. I mean, whatever it takes, right? So we, we, began, we began moving on to the houseboat and it was hard. And when we say yes to God, it's not like, oh, everything's awesome. It was hard at first. I mean, I didn't have a washer and dryer, so I'd have to load up my laundry in a wagon and walk through the marina and do my laundry in in the marina. I didn't have an oven. I had a stovetop. My bath was, I love baths, and my bath was super tiny. So unless you're a contortionist, you cannot take a bath in there. I tried. Um, Our kids' closet was, or our kids, like, shared a room. And it was super tiny. So it was crazy. And I had a few pity parties, and I was kind of a brat about it at first, but nobody came when I threw those pity parties, so I quit having them. And eventually, God started to work on my heart. And what started as this process of like, oh, it was hard, it began to be something that we grew to love. It began to be a place where we felt this freedom we had never felt, and we just were able to hear from God in a way we had never heard from God before and God was so faithful in that moment and before this we did not know nor did we want to start a church I'm not gonna lie to you like this was not like our 10-year plan like we had no desire but it was in that place that God spoke to us and called us to do that and and I just look around and I go where would we be I'm so grateful for what God's done and allowing us to be part of what's going on here in this family that that God has started and just to, to tell you how the story ends. It has nothing to do with the message, but a storm hit the lake. Three storms in a row. If you were around last year, you might have known, but three storms in a row hit Lake Pleasant, destroyed the marina, totaled our boat, mandatory evacuation. We're like loading up laundry baskets full of our like life's belongings, which had been whittled down. Um, And we were homeless while we launched this church, living with friends. And and, uh, in that, we, because our boat was totaled, the insurance company gave us all of our money back that we originally invested. So we were able to move back to land and get a house. And then like a month later, the insurance company called and said, um, so we have this gigantic boat that we don't know what to do with. So we're going to give it back to you for free. So isn't that how amazing God is? He was not after our money. He was not after our stuff. God wasn't after he didn't need that he needed our heart he needed to know that we were all in I'm not gonna lie though it's a struggle now that we're in a house again like because y'all came to my garage sale and bought my stuff I don't have anything left (laughs) so I need you to bring it back next Sunday if you could but I've had to we've had to buy some furniture we've had to to start purchasing some more things and it feels kind of good to get it, you know what I mean? It does. I want a nice house and nice things, and I find myself getting wrapped up in it again. And essentially, there's nothing wrong with, with having a nice home and things like that, but it's hard not to let it become 
the focus. It's hard not to let it become the priority, and it was the priority in the rich young ruler's life because as soon as Jesus said, hey, I need you to do this, he said, "Uh uh-uh. He walked away grieving. Another translation says he walked away sad, but almost all commentaries agree that that's too mild to put it. He was devastated, and he was distraught. But even though he was lacking, and even though walking away tore his heart apart, he still chose to walk away from Jesus. And I think there's so much God wants to do in our lives. There's so much that he wants to do in us and through us. But because we hang on to what we have let the world define as success and happiness, and we hang on to that, like this is what it looks like, I feel like God has so much more that he wants to do. And it's going to take us letting go to say yes to him. So as I prepared this message, I was really praying and asking God, okay, like, how do I find simplicity here? Like, if we're going to be talking about the simple life and what that looks like, and our life feels anything but simple these days, and I'm struggling to maintain this simplicity in a season that's busy and crazy, and um, how do I find simplicity here? And, And God really reminded me of the example of Paul. And so we're gonna, we're gonna turn to um, Philippians chapter four, verse 13. 11 through 13, actually. It's more in the New Testament. I lost my place here, so. And chapter 11, it says, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now Paul had been through it all. Paul had been shipwrecked, imprisoned, persecuted. He had had a lot, he had had a little. So if anybody can confidently say, I've figured it out, it's Paul. And I love that he says, I've learned. So contentment is a learned behavior. It's not something that comes naturally to us. What comes naturally to us is wanting more. And the thing is, is Jesus has more to offer us, but it looks different than what the world has to offer us. The second learned in verse 12, when it says learned there, it would have actually been more of like a reference to like a pagan, like, initiation into like a pagan religion or like a cult, like knowing the inner secrets. That's kind of the the meaning behind that second um, learned we see in verse 12. And so Paul's essentially saying like, I've been initiated into this idea of contentment. God walked me through a ton of stuff to get to this place where now I'm content and I get that it doesn't matter what I have, what I don't, who's coming against me, who's not. I've figured it out. And the answer's found in, in the last verse there. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. If we just break that into two parts and we look at it in isolated, in two sections, I can do all things. Maybe that's where the rich young ruler stopped. I can do all things. He thought he had the power in him. He thought that he could figure it out and do what he needed to do to find the happiness and contentment that he so desperately wanted. But he was missing the second part of that. It's through Christ. And I can't tell you what contentment and simplicity looks like in your life, so I can't necessarily give you three steps. Because for each of us, it's different. God might be calling you to be a millionaire and build us a building, and I just received that in Jesus' name. Um, but, But I can't tell you what that looks like for you. But we do know the answer is Jesus. So if we were to simplify it and if we were to try to sum it up in just a few things based on the story of the rich young ruler, I would say that the first thing that we need to do is we need to ask Jesus. We need to ask him. Each individually go before him. In Mark, this same story, it says that the rich young ruler actually fell at the feet of Jesus. He was so desperate. And I think that, you know what, sometimes we just need to fall at the feet of Jesus and go, show me. Show me what to do. It's a dangerous prayer because he might say, sell everything and go live on a boat. You know, so it's a dangerous prayer. But ask him. If there are stumbling blocks or blind spots that we're not seeing, ask Jesus to reveal it. Because even though it might be painful to follow or maybe it's painful to kind of try to overcome those obstacles and those stumbling blocks, on the other side of it, there's freedom. 
and there's a peace that you've not known and there's a joy you haven't experienced and there's a moment where you get to show, see God show up and show off in ways that you never would have if you played it safe and kept buying into the world. So ask Jesus. And again, it's gonna, what he says to you is gonna be different than what he says to us. And that's the beautiful thing about this journey. And we're not here to judge what your journey looks like or what God's calling you to do or not do. We're just here to preach the word of God and let him speak to each of us individually. The second thing we need to do is we need to choose Jesus because after we hear him speak, we have a choice. The rich young ruler, he had a choice. Unfortunately, he chose the world. And I can tell you because John and I both grew up in the world, not having a relationship with Jesus. We've been there. We've searched the world and tried to, to, to gain from everything it had to offer. And it is a lie that comes up empty. It is going to leave you like that song says, alone. It's going to seem more and more like a nightmare. We're going to get caught up and we're going to be weary. We're going to be chasing the wrong things. And we're going to be going, how did I get here? So we have a choice. And that's the beautiful thing about following Jesus. He gives us free will. Free will to choose what it is we want. If we want to chase that, and then he's always so lovingly waiting to go, are you done yet? Are you ready to try things my way? Because I love you so very much, and I have big things in store for you. It looks a little different than what you thought, but if you'll trust me, we can go on this journey together. And then the last thing we need to do is trust Jesus. Because like I said, it doesn't always look and feel like I made the right choice. <laughs> I mean, there were moments on the boat where it's freezing cold and John's out there trying to tie our, our boat, the ropes break and our ski boat's flying off and he's asking me to hang on so it doesn't like, you know, float away into the lake and I don't have on a life jacket and I'm thinking, Jesus, are you, is this really where you brought us to? I'm gonna die right here in Lake Pleasant. But there are moments that it's scary and there are moments you feel like you're hanging on for dear life and there are moments you might question whether or not this was the right move. But if you have asked Jesus and if you have chosen to follow him and be completely obedient, even when it gets scary, if you just hang on, there is promise and there is peace on the other side of it and he is in it and it is gonna be greater than you could have ever imagined otherwise. And we'll just close with a, a story of a fisherman there was a fisherman that was sitting lazily by his boat and along came a rich man. The rich man was kind of irritated that he was just sitting there and not working and he said, why aren't you out there catching fish? And the, the fisherman said, I already did that for the day. And he said, well, why don't you go out there and catch more? And the fisherman's like, why would I do that? He said, because then if you do that, you could sell them. And if you sell them, then you could get better nets. And if you get better nets, then you'll catch more fish and you'll be rich. You could get more boats, you'll have a fleet. And the fisherman was kind of confused and he said, and then, and then what? And the rich man said, well, then you can just kick back and enjoy life. The fisherman's like, well, isn't that what I'm doing right now? <laughs> right? Isn't that kind of the cycle we're in? I, I really truly believe that God has come to give us life and life to the full. That's what the word of God says. I believe that. He wants us to have fulfillment and joy and peace. He didn't come to strip everything away from us just because he just wants us to live lives of poverty. He just wants our heart. So maybe you're here today and you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. We're gonna close in prayer in just a moment. And if you're here today and, and you're saying, you know, the person sitting next to you, they drug you here, you didn't even wanna come. Maybe Jesus is actually saying, I want you to follow me. Maybe he's saying, are you done trying things your own way? Because that's not really working out so great. And if that's you today, I would love to just follow, uh, lead you in a little prayer and you can just follow along silently in your heart. And if everybody will bow your heads as we pray, nobody's looking around, but if that's you today, if you're here and you're ready to be all in and you're ready to, to fall after Jesus, you can just lift up your hand so I know who I'm praying for. See some hands and you can just follow along with me and just say something like this, Lord, I may not have it all figured out, but I want to say yes to you. I believe that you died on the cross for me and I wanna be fully surrendered 
Lord, show me how to do that. Show me how to follow you, and I will trust you as we start this journey together. In Jesus' name, amen.